Okay, so um, I think and I believe the greatest break in the scripture is between Genesis chapter 11 and chapter 12. Uh, right now we are in chapter 12, the call of Abraham. At that time his name was Abram. So when God focused his attention and his mission and his blessing on just one person and his descendants. Um, if by now we see people rebelling against God's mission, now we see God personally involved in his mission. He's no longer telling them, oh, just multiply and fill the earth. Three times is enough to see that we are not able to do this by ourselves. But and now God is involved uh, uh, and... Um, and uh, the first attack was, remember, Adam and Eve, we will be gods. Um, God restarted then with a couple, Adam and Eve. Um, the second attack uh, against, his, uh, against his mission was, we are demigods. We are like heroes of legends. We can do it. By like that mixing between demons and people and men, uh, it's like the hybrid uh, part. And God restarted then with how many people? Four? Eight. Yes, four couples. So you have one couple here, two people, and four couples here, eight people here. But now in chapter 12, he restarts again after the Tower of Babel with one person, Abram. So let's see how he... Uh, He's doing this. Genesis chapter 12, verse two, uh, 1. And we will unfold the story. Right now we are reading just the, three, the first three verses. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God restarts his mission with one man, with one person, Abram. And this is based on his promise. Based on his promise, not on his ability to do things, but on God's ability to do things through him and for him. Every time when God restarted, his mission was simply giving by the direction, you know, be fruitful, go multiply. But this, we see this in the Garden of Eden, we see that after the flood, but not after the Tower of Babel. The instruction to fill the earth was a command in the beginning, but with Abram, the only command is to get out from his country. That's interesting. Because if you read verse 2 and 3, everywhere is God. He's on God. I will. I will. I will. Not you will. You will. So if you obey me and get out of your country and your family, and you dedicate your life to me, you consecrate your life to me. I will make you great. Your, your name, from you will come like a nation and, and ev everybody will bless you. I will bless them. Um, I don't know if you would be Abram, you would follow this kind of instruction, but this is the big change of the game concerning God's mission on earth. The weight on the, on the accomplishment of the mission is not on Abram. The pressure is not on him, but it's on God. From now on, and just imagine this. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but the Bible is 11 chapters to get to Abraham fast. And from now on, it's about the God, God's covenant with Abraham till the end. So if you want to divide the Bible, this is the division. Before Abraham... After Abraham. And that's big. Because before Abraham, God said, you do it. You do it. You do it. 
After Abraham, God said, I will. I will. You just obey. You just believe. Now, that's bad. For people who are used to do things, that's bad. Um, bad news. So, I don't have to do anything? Um, actually, I, I, I was talking with a person, and I said, um, you know, the good news is about God doing things, and you just obey. Would you like to trust your life? And he said, no. Why? Because I'm not doing anything. It's too easy. It's too easy to obtain salvation just believing. I mean, I don't have to do anything. No. It's already done. You just believe. No, that's not for me. So, um, you see, in, in verse 2 and 3, like in two verses, for four times, God will say, I will. God makes a promise to Abram, um, and Abram is just the recipient. Uh, God is the one who initiates. He is the one who provides. He is the one who gives growth. And Abram is the one believing and enjoying. And by the way, if you think that the Christian life is things to do, you are just a legalist. Christian life is who you are. And that changes the things that you are doing. So identity is one of the most important things in this relationship. Uh, what did Abram do to deserve God's favor? I'm waiting for an answer. What did Abram do to deserve God's favor, God's grace? Sacrifice. Sacrifice, okay. Anything else? Obedience, okay. Trust Anything in else? His what? Trust in, his promise. Trust in His promise, okay, good. One more person, one more person. I need one more. Believe, I don't know. Huh? Believe, believe. believe, yeah, it's trust and believe. Follow God. Follow God? All of you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I tricked you because the, He did nothing. When God chose Him, God was not impressed with Abram. Abram did nothing. Nothing. Like imagine, yes, after God initiated, yes, Abram obeyed. Abram believed. But before that, what he had done? He's done nothing. Uh, who was Abram before God met him? and initiated the relationship with him. He was an idolater. He was an idolater. You see, um, um, we can do anything to earn God's favor. We are already sinners. And whatever we do is bad. We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like polluted, polluted garments. Do you know? Okay, I will be descriptive here. Imagine, do you know, do you know what a leper is, right? It is full of, uh, his body is full of blood and pus and things like that. You take a, a white she, you put around him, and when you look at that, this is your best deeds, polluted garments. When God looks at that, he vomits. He said, whoa, I can't look at that. Our best deeds, we can't impress God. You can't impress God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith.
faith. Why? This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Because we are so good on that. If we can do something, we will blackmail God. You know, God, I'm good. Well, I, you can't do your mission without me. I'm smart. I have skills. God said, no. Take him out. I don't need him. You can't do anything to earn God's favor. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Remember this verse? We had it on, quoted, some time ago. So, who was Abram? Abram was a Semite. His father, Terah, used to live in Haran, in the country of Aram, and he moved in Ur, the capital of Sumer. Haran was born there in Ur, and he died there. Okay, I have a, a picture from, um, oh, uh, yeah, this is part of the, what Ur was in, in that time. It's a ziggurat. No, that, that is a good one. But, um, ha so Haran, his father, was born in uh, there in Or, and after his death, Terah made the plan to move in Canaan. Um, at that time, Or, or was well developed by Ur Namu, and that is the stella that uh, is the first picture. Yeah, one more. Uh, on this stella, you see, this is uh, Urnam, uh, or Nama, or Namu. Uh, he is the one there, and he worships the moon god, the crescent god, uh, moon. is the moon god, Nana. Uh, Urnamu developed the oldest known law cults, which predates the code of Hammurabi, with 300 years. He started, and he and his son started what we know as the Renaissance of Sumer. Well, Abram was not a Sumerian. He was a Semite. So probably they used to live in Aram, in Haram area. Could you give me that, that, that uh, map? Right here. It is possible that they lived right here, their names and their family names match with the Aram country. And probably they moved to Ur because Ur was the capital of Sumer and was well, well developed. But because of the uh, economical and political situation, they wanted to move back to Haram. And this is, and from here, Abraham, Abram, at that moment, he moved to Canaan because God called him and he said, I want you to go to a country. Uh, the text doesn't say what country. And this is so interesting. So, um, what we know about Abram, he, he lived in a, one of the most modern cities of the ancient Mesopotamia. A well-developed city in the best dynasty of Sumeria, or three. So I think it was like stupid to leave that place, to go in Haran back. But God called him, okay? And he was an idolater. He was worshiping other gods. Could you go back with two, one more? You see that little verse here, Joshua 24, 2? And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham, and of Nahor, and they served, what? Other gods. Abraham was not the perfect person for to be a Christian, okay? He was an idolater. But God called him. And he said, 
I want to do something with you. Do you agree? If you agree, get out this hunting, get out this your family, and worship me. Um, Abram grew up in an era where God Munana was worshipped. The main center was in Ur, the second main center was in Haran. But he's moving to Canaan. So you see what is going on? God made a promise, and the promise is about the future. God didn't sign a paper or gave Abram something and he said, hey, uh, this is just a little bit. No, he didn't. He said, go there. Where? There. Do you think you would be a believer like Abraham? Ever. Like Rodolfo? Get out of Vienna and go. <coughs> and Rodolfo will ask, Where, Lord? Just go. In the country I will show you. But Lord, where is the country? You are dead? Just go. And you end up somewhere. And then, walking, you think, Maybe God will tell me where is <laughs> where to stop. Right? This is the belief that Abraham had. That's why he is the father of all believers. And his name is great. Because he was, he, he, he took God for his word. Um, the, the covenant is started here, but actually you find the covenant in chapter 15 and reaffirm in chapter 17. So it's a process. If you are like me, I want to know everything from the beginning, you know. Lord, tell me everything, and then I will follow you. It's like B1, right? When we started B1, we said, we will be an international church. How? We don't know. It's a journey. But when God is in that journey with you, this is enough. He is with you. And He said, I will be with you. The promise was for a nation... That means he will have kids. He was 70-ish. A personal blessing. And then God said, I will make you a great name. And his name is great among Jews, Christians, and Muslims. The three monotheistic religions today. All these promises would give him the position to be a blessing to all other nations. To all the families. It's kind of a like God mission, right? Go to all nations. Till the end of the earth. I want to fill the earth with my glory. That's it. That was God's mission. And God said, I want to fulfill my mission through you. One person. And if somebody will curse you, I will curse them. Why? He was in a covenant relationship with God. Everything that happened to Abram happened to God. But God's interest became Abram's interest. You say, see, both ways. Now, let's turn to you. I know that God is speaking to you. I know this because He is the one who takes initiative. He invites you to jump in and join in His mission. Question, are you an idolater? So what? He can change you. Are you a sinner? So what? He can make you white. He can sanctify you. It's all about Him, not about you. Like Abram situation. He promised you that if you believe in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ died for you and repent, He will experience death, suffering, and sin for you. And you don't have to. And instead of this, He said, I will give you a city. And that city, if you read the book of Revelation, is called God's city. The New Jerusalem. And you will never experience death, and never experience suffering, and never experience sin. 
what you need to do is just believe like Abram. Okay, pack your things and go. Where, Lord? Eh, just go. Yes, sir. And that is counted what? Righteousness. Justification. So, it's based on a promise, but also, uh, God restarts, when God restarts His mission with a, one person, He based this on a promise, and also, He's sharing this vision with that person. Listen up. Verse 5. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions, and they had gathered, and the people, and listen, and the people that they had acquired in, in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At the time the Canaanites were in the land, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and he pitched his tent his bed with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord and Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. I don't know what you're going to do, but Abram obeyed. He obeyed and as a patriarch, he took his family and he said, now you come after me. Uh, okay, Abraham, where? I don't know. But my father said he wants to go, he wanted to go to Canaan. We'll go there and we'll see. Uh, today it's okay. But in that time, in ancient time, you never uh, uh, went out of your comfort zone, your, your place. You are born here, you die here, everything was around. But to move was a big deal. Now, Abraham moved twice. Ur to Haran, and now Haran to Canaan. Um, so, he took with him also the souls or people who were acquired or obtained in Haran. Who are the souls acquired in Haran? It seems that they were like slaves, right? Acquired. You think, oh, he obtained. He bought them. They were his slaves. Yeah, sure. Yes, sir, I'm going. But let's read again the text. The text will tell you. And will tell us. Verse 6. So he passed through the land to the place of Shechem. Could you give us the, uh, the map? Yeah. So this is here. Shechem and then Bethel. Okay. So he passed that and he stopped there at that the 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 oak of Mora. Um, if you know that the Canaanites built their altars uh, altars mainly in the oak forests. So it is possible that that place of Mora was actually a Canaanite religious center called, and actually the word Mora means the teacher. So that place was a Canaanite um, praying center or religious center called the teacher. Probably you came there to be taught by gods. So he stopped there. And what Abram did? An altar. To whom? Yahweh. Not the Canaanites' uh, idols. Verse 8. He pitched his, his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built another altar, a second altar, to the Lord. When you see Lord is Yahweh, the word in, in, the, in the, the original is Yahweh. God's personal name, and called upon the name of the Lord. Now, uh, in Hebrew, to call is the, the, the verb, call, is kara, means to 
call or to invoke or to proclaim. Abram was proclaiming the name of Yahweh in the middle of paganism. He was preaching Yahweh among the pagans, Canaanite pagans. Now, if you connect verse 6 with verse 8, it seems like the souls that Abram acquired in Haran were people who were influenced by Abraham to follow Yahweh, not servants. He didn't pay them. He conquered them. And for uh, Yahweh. And he was proclaiming God on his personal and covenantal name, Yahweh. Um, in modern Christ Christian language, we would call this how? Discipleship. <laughs> Discipleship. After making covenant with Yahweh, Abram became a preacher. And some people from Haran started to follow him and his vision. And now my question is, whose vision? God's vision. Where are you going, uh, Abram? Um, I will head Canaan. And when you will stop? When God will tell me. Oh, this is not very, I'm, I don't trust you, man. This is not very, you know, it's, a, it's not a good vision. But you know what? Because you proclaim the name of Yahweh, I will trust you. Not just Him. I will trust you too. And you know what happened? God showed Himself to him. You see the word appeared? It's the same word, the verb to, to see something. To see is the verb ra, that means to see, to perceive, or to become aware of. So he, God became aware to him. He was perceived by, I don't know, maybe God took a human form. Because it was, he said, he built an altar where he... Uh, uh, altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And then he showed him his, his country and said, look, everything is here, is yours, and your, to your descendants. And this is God's vision. He showed himself and he showed the land and he said, this is yours. And now, after so much time, after God appeared to him the first time, Abraham knew. And he said, man, this is the land. Now I know. So Rodolfo, after a while, God will tell and this is yours. Oh yeah, sure. Got it. Now I see it. This is mine. And my descendants. And I will be here. So Abraham took more like, rights to see the whole thing. <laughs> that country was not his already. But he was looking into this country like, oh man, this is mine. Oh, this is beautiful. This is mine too. This is my descendants. This is my nation. So God shared the vision of filling the country with His glory through Him, through Abraham and his descendants. Now we have the same country. I see the country, but I don't see the descendants. <laughs> so in Haran, God said, I will give you a country. What country? Hmm. We'll see. Now Abraham sees the country, sees the Lord. And he said, well, I don't see the descendants. I don't have kids. Oh, no problem with it. You'll, you'll have them. You see, this is something that we do today. We walk by faith. You know what, it, what is this? You take a step, and God says, you see, when you'll do the next step, you'll see this. Lord, I don't see it. <laughs> Just make that step. Take that step. Oh, yeah, I see that. And next step. And next step. And that was Abraham's life. And this is our life. This is discipleship. This is how God treats us. Giving us the next step. Not the whole thing. He tells you what is going on. But not details. All the details are his details, not mine. And we are part of his plan. So, 
God restarts his mission with one man. Based on what? Based on what? A promise. By grace, Abraham was an idolater. And then he shares, God shares with him a vision. Look, this is yours. And Abraham was like, yes, that's mine. Now I see. And a lot of people were following him. Now, we expect, I don't know about you, but I expect that the next step is bigger, right? No. Actually, no. I expect something greater, but sorry for disappointing you. Abram was imperfect. If you are an illegalist or, you know, an idea, a uh, Christian idealist, you will say, man, I'm so disturbed on this passage. This passage is, uh, I don't know what to do with it. After Abram made a covenant, God made a covenant, made a covenant with him, Abram did something interesting. Let's read. Now there was a famine in the land. Verse 10. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful, you are a woman of beautiful in appearance, and then the Egyptians see you, they will say, oh, this is his wife, then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that I may go well with me, it, uh, it, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes uh, of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken in a, into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, she, he, dwelt, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, male uh, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men order orders concerning him and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had <coughs> you expect that everything will go like this and then boom if you're a legalist will say oh now he's out God will kick him kick him out of church God will kick him out of his kingdom no and you know why because he's in a covenant with God. He is in a covenant with God. He's not perfect. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He is manipulating his wife. <laughs> but he is in a covenant relationship with God. And God is acting against Pharaoh. That's so interesting. Well, during that time, approximately, approximately uh, 2090, 20, 2090 BC, that is almost the year when, uh, approximately the year when Abram was in Egypt. Um, in Egypt was the first intermediate period described as the dark age of ancient Egyptian history. This was the 10th dynasty in the lower Egypt and Pharaoh was... I don't know how to, uh, uh, his name is very interesting, Actos or Ectoi. And he was described as a king who caused much harm to the inhabitants of Egypt, was sized with madness, and it is says that he was killed by a crocodile. I don't know, this is history. Uh, this Actoi, this uh, pharaoh, is often described as an evil and Note this, violent, violent behavior. Now, I understand why Abraham said, oh, tell him that you are my sister, not my wife. Because he's mad 
he's violent, they're all killing me, me like this, and done. So tell him that you are my sister. You know what kind of a lie was this? A white lie. Like half true. Because she was his step his sister, but also he, she was his wife. And he gave them what they wanted to hear. He was playing. He was manipulating. Long story short, he was deported from Egypt because the truth was discovered. Who discovered the truth? Who <coughs> uncovered the truth? God. <laughs> His partner. God, uh, Yahweh, intervened in a dramatic way and he touched Pharaoh physically his life in his house, like his harem, his wife's, with great, the text said, with great plagues. Egyptians were a very super, superstitious nation, and any plague was interpreted as the beginning of great troubles. And he said, man, troubles are coming. What is wrong? And then, probably he or someone else said, maybe your new addition, <laughs> Sarai. And he went straight to Abram and he said, Sarah is your wife, right? <laughs> you got me, man. You got me. Why do you say that? Because, so he is a madman, he's a violent man, but he is also afraid. And they, and they kicked Abram and Sarai out of Egypt. God's plan was in jeopardy because of Abram's decision. Everyone was in danger, and, and also God's promise was in danger. God was protecting, uh, but God was protecting his mission. Uh, I think this is a takeaway from this story, from this narrative. God will do anything to protect his mission? Yes. It is foolish, foolishness, to, uh, foolishness to try escaping from troubles by dishonest means. Another thing is fear of men. He, he, Abram feared the Egyptians. So fear of man gets you in trouble. But what does the Bible say about fear of God? The fear of God is? The, the fear is God. Yes, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But the fear of men is? There is a proverb about that. Yeah. So, we are... Oh, by the way, there is another thing. The consequences are not just right now, but they are long term. When I read this, the text, did you figure out that when Abram received a lot of things from Pharaoh, in exchange of Sarah. It was something like female servants. Hagar was an Egyptian. She was one of them. And by the way, Hagar was very beautiful. Hagar became his wife. That started a fight and troubles in his family later on. And the boy, Ishmael, is a donkey. His character is like a donkey, stubborn. He is the father of all Ishmaelites. And by the way, they are enemies of Israel even today. If you turn on the TV and you hear anything about that part of the world, it's because of Hagar and Sarah, and it's because of fear of men and Abram and Egypt. Everything started there and even collapses right now and more. It's, the history is, is, will go more on this, so it's not over there. Okay, uh, could you go a little bit further? I think I have two more. Also, this is a, like the, the oak. 
or the Terebin, where where uh, Abram was proclaiming the name of the Lord, and then number two, sharing the vision, and then number three, protecting God was protecting His plan. This is the Pharaoh, and probably that was here the lower Egypt. He ended up here, and then he went back home. Um, probably Memphis. We don't know, but that area. In conclusion, God can start with you. Listen well. With you. One person. Not a church. Not a family. With one person. God can, is able to start with you his mission if you obey his command to go. If you believe the promise and if you preach him among the pagans of this world, in Vienna or whatever, in order to make disciples who call also his name. Because of your covenantal relationship with him, the result of your actions will be changed toward your blessing. Let's think, you, are, you and me, or maybe not you, but I'm like Abram. I do a lot of good things and then phew, destroy everything. You know what God said about this? If you are His child, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to to his purpose. God will intervene. You know why? Sometimes dramatically. You know why? He's in a covenant with me. I'm his and he's mine. Sometimes my troubles become his troubles. Not sometimes. What I'm saying. Every time. My problems are his problems. But you know what? His interests are my interests. His plans my plan. Would you like to be that man, to be that person, to be that woman? No. Would you dare to be the one? What do you think? What kind of a God is our God to deal with imperfect persons like us?